Hello everyone, Marsh W13 here with a Thanksgiving food video. It is Thursday, November 26, 2020. Thanksgiving Day here in the United States, a very special holiday. People normally travel great distances to spend with their family. But the pandemic this year has of course significantly impacted the travel plans of many. But whatever the case, I invite you to join me as I prepare a traditional Thanksgiving meal. Well, thank you for deciding to stay and join me. Thanksgiving did not become an official holiday in the United States until Lincoln proclaimed it so in 1863, but it was celebrated long before then, more or less since the birth of our great nation. And traditionally, Thanksgiving dinner consists of turkey and side dishes and plenty of ingredients native to the new world like corn, potatoes, pumpkin or squash, and cranberries. So I prepared a special menu for today's meal, including turkey roast with turkey gravy, honey spice glazed ham, cranberry sauce with orange and spices, pumpkin pie dump cake, cream spinach souffle, corn pudding, traditional herb bread stuffing, green bean casserole, mashed potatoes, and rolls. So I'm going to start with the turkey because it takes the longest to cook, about three hours. And this Thanksgiving, I purchased a roast, which you'll see in a moment. But right now, I'm going to prepare a mixture with which to rub the exterior of the turkey roast for purposes of retaining moisture and adding some color in the roasting process. And to achieve that, I'm mixing butter with some Sicilian olive oil. And I'm just gonna add some freshly ground black pepper and some herbe de Provence. And if you're not familiar with Herbe de Provence, it's a French-inspired spice mixture containing dried marjoram, rosemary, thyme, oregano, and lavender. So many of those spices are traditional holiday flavors in the United States, while some are not so traditional. But we're just going to mix that together. And here's our turkey roast. And I'm just going to apply some of our butter, oil, and spice mixture. And we'll just rub that on to ensure it covers the whole thing. The idea being here that this will keep the turkey breast moist and also flavor some of the drippings that collect in the bottom of the pan, which we'll then use to make our turkey gravy at the very end. So into the hot oven goes the turkey and it will roast for about three hours. Now the ham will cook at the same temperature so we'll go ahead and prepare that as well. The ham however is already cooked so I'm just going to prepare a honey glaze for it and we'll roast it just long enough to form the glaze. And the glaze mixture will consist of honey, brown sugar, just a touch of ground mustard, and some cinnamon mixed with cloves and some other holiday spices. And we'll just mix that all together. Now we're going to pour on the glaze. And spread it a bit across the ham. And then it goes to roast at a low temperature along with the turkey. And while our turkey and ham roast, I'm going to prepare the cranberry sauce. So we'll start with some orange juice. and sugar. And mix that together until it dissolves. And when the orange juice mixture is good and hot, we'll throw in our cranberries, which I washed in a colander.
and we'll just mix those together because they'll start to cook pretty quickly. I'm going to add some Thanksgiving spices, cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, allspice. And it takes about 10 minutes, but the cranberries will begin to burst and the mixture will have cooked down combined with the juices released from the cranberries and it will solidify a bit into a thick sauce as it cools. You can now see that we've taken it off the heat and it's beginning to cool. Cranberry sauce is a traditional accompaniment to turkey in the United States, much like lingonberries with meatballs in Sweden. And while our cranberry sauce cools, the honey glazed ham has emerged from the oven and it's resting. And our turkey roast is just done as well. I've reserved some of the drippings from the pan to use for our turkey gravy a bit later. And you can see some of the herbs we used to coat the turkey have made it into the drippings. Because it will take a while to set and cool, I'm going to go ahead and make the pumpkin pie dump cake. Now, pumpkin pie is a traditional Thanksgiving dessert made from a pureed pumpkin custard filling, but we're going to make our pumpkin pie dump cake style. A dump cake being a sort of cobbler with a pie filling base topped with yellow cake mix that forms sort of a cookie-like crust. So to make the traditional custard base for our dump cake, we're combining pureed pumpkin, evaporated milk, our traditional pumpkin pie spices of cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, and allspice. Sugar, since the pumpkin puree does not come sweetened. and eggs, which make this into the custardy pie filling we all want it to be. And we're just going to mix this all together. And as I said, the dump cake starts with the custard base, so we're going to pour our pumpkin mixture into a cake pan. And for the crust, we're going to top our pumpkin custard with yellow cake mix. And when you combine the yellow cake mix with butter and bake it, you end up with a really dense sort of crispy cookie-like crust. And you want to make sure you have full butter coverage over the entire surface. Now our pumpkin pie dump cake is ready to go into the oven. And it'll bake for about an hour until that crispy brown crust from the cake mix forms. And our pumpkin pie dump cake is out of the oven cooling. Now it takes a while for the pumpkin custard to cool and to set. And the same to some extent can be said for the topping. So we'll let it do its thing. And that gives us time to make our cream spinach souffle, which is an interesting take on cream spinach. This recipe originated with late night host David Letterman's late mother Dorothy of all people. And you'll see it has some unique ingredients. 
Now, the original recipe calls for raw onion, but we're going to saute our finely diced onion first in some butter just to get it a bit softer so that it better integrates into our casserole. And I didn't season the onion with anything. I use unsalted butter as well. We just want it to soften a bit and become translucent, maybe five minutes of cooking time total. And I think it's pretty much done now. So I've turned off the burner. And now we're ready to build our souffle batter. And you'll see why I'm calling it a cream spinach souffle. And I'll tell you from the start that the key to this is to overcook the souffle until it becomes quite firm and a bit browned. Having said that, this recipe calls for some rather interesting ingredients, and we're going to combine them in this food processor before we blend them. We're going to start with a brick of Philadelphia cream cheese. We'll add the diced onions that we sauteed in butter. And now some hot beef stock. And a couple of eggs. And this is basically the creamy custard batter that we'll be adding to our spinach before we bake it into its souffle form. And now we're going to blend this until it's milky smooth with no lumps. And finally, in a baking dish, we'll start with our foundational ingredient, spinach. This spinach has been fully cooked. And then we add our custard cream. And stir until the two are well integrated. And that's just about it. Now our spinach souffle is ready for the oven and in it goes. I'm cooking it by itself because it requires a slightly higher temperature than other dishes. And I cook this at least 40 minutes until it's really no longer soupy and more of a set custard with a little brownness on top. And here's the finished product. So with our cream spinach souffle cooling, we can now complete the rest of our side dishes, which are all relatively simple in their own ways. And perhaps the simplest of all of them is corn pudding, which is a sort of spoon bread that originated in the southern United States in Appalachia. And our version contains only five simple ingredients. A box of Jiffy cornbread mix, a can of creamed corn, a can of regular whole kernel corn, which I did drain, sour cream, and melted butter. And we're just going to stir all of this until it forms a batter of sorts. And that simple batter goes into a pan. I'm just going to smooth out the surface so that it's relatively level for baking. And just like that, into the oven it goes. Now, no Thanksgiving meal would be complete without a traditional dressing or stuffing. I suppose you'd call it stuffing if you had a full-size turkey and actually stuffed your bird with it. 
but we're cooking our dressing on the side. There are multiple types of typical Thanksgiving stuffing, including a popular cornbread variety, which I've made before. But since we just put some corn pudding in the oven, we're going to stick with the regular herbed bread stuffing this time. And we're going to start with some melted butter. And in goes our diced onion and celery. And I'm going to cook these until they're quite tender, which is probably beyond the recommended saute time, but that's my preference. When you're satisfied with the vegetables, you simply add chicken broth, which will bring to a nice boil. And to the boiling broth and vegetables, we'll add our bread and herbs. And we're just going to mix this together. The bread will absorb the boiling liquid rather quickly and become a bit mushy. So we're going to bake this as well, and it too will become a bit like a dry bread pudding when all is said and done. And now it's ready to join our corn pudding baking away in the oven. While our corn pudding and traditional herb dressing finish baking, let's make one of the most uniquely American traditional Thanksgiving side dishes, the green bean casserole. This recipe was introduced by the Campbell Soup Company in 1955 and has become a staple on Thanksgiving tables, mostly because it uses canned ingredients that most Americans had in their pantries, particularly the cream of mushroom soup, given the prevalence of casseroles in that era. So this is another super simple recipe, and I'm going to add just a slight twist to it. We start with two cans of green beans, and to that, our can of condensed cream of mushroom soup, which, as I mentioned, is the basis of most American casserole recipes. And we just mix these two ingredients together. And I'm going to warm them up so that it will take a bit less time in the oven. Now to the warmed green bean and condensed mushroom soup mixture, we're going to add just a little bit of grated cheddar cheese. I'm using the sharp variety today, but any will do. And I'll just blend that in. Since the mixture has been warmed, the cheese will start to melt immediately. And our cheesy green bean mushroom soup mixture goes into a baking dish. And the real key unique ingredient in this casserole is canned french fried onions. Another uniquely American item and we're using a whole can of it to form the crunchy topping for our casserole. And I've added just another slight twist here by blending some of the french fried onions with the rest of the shredded cheddar cheese to form a cheesy top layer of onions. And into the oven goes the green bean casserole to firm up the green beans and soup and lightly toast the onion and cheese mixture on top. Okay, with all of our side dishes either baking or cooling, we're almost done cooking, so let's make our gravy. Remember, I had reserved some of the juices from the herb turkey roast, so I'm now going to add those to this thick gravy mixture I have warming up in the pan. And now we're just going to stir this and then cook it until it's the nice, thick, 
but smooth gravy consistency that we desire. And it's thickening up nicely as we bring it off of a boil. And I think it's done. The only last thing I'm going to do before we eat is to warm up some rolls. Now, these are Parker House style rolls, popularized in the 1870s as an homage to the Parker House Hotel in Boston, Massachusetts. Phew, we're done. So all that's left is to eat. You can enjoy your Thanksgiving dinner at a table with family or this season on your couch with a movie or a roaring fire whatever you choose as long as you're responsible and socially distanced so let's see how everything came out we have our turkey breast herb dressing with turkey gravy honey glazed ham with drippings mashed potatoes with turkey gravy our citrus cranberry sauce green bean casserole topped with french fried onions and cheese cream spinach souffle corn pudding and of course our yeast roll and I've paired this meal with some wine, a California Red Zinfandel blend called The Fugitive, a Gewürztraminer Cabinet from Rheinhessen, which will taste a bit like a Riesling, but with more spice notes that should pair well with all the traditional Thanksgiving flavors on the plate. And I have a Prosecco, a dry, sparkling wine from the Veneto region of Italy that's a rather neutral and universally applicable pairing given its acidity. Well, that's just about all, everyone. Thanks again for joining me on my Thanksgiving culinary journey today. I hope you enjoyed watching the cooking as much as I'm going to enjoy the eating. And although you may not be spending as much time with your families this holiday season, we can all take comfort in continuing these traditions and sharing them virtually. Until next time, happy holidays. March W13, out.